What is it you are doing? I was getting my tricorder. Tricorder? Is it a weapon? It is a tool. I intended to use it to see... To see if I was real. Proceed. Use your tricorder. <laughs> well? You are Klingon. What else could I be? The Klingons of the Star Trek multiverse are the great frenemy of the Federation. They are always willing to throw down the gauntlet over matters of personal honor, always willing to throw themselves screaming into battle for a friend, and are experts at throwing shade. I will fight any battle, anywhere. They are part Viking, part Samurai, and perhaps even part Jihadist. What we know about Klingons comes most directly from the Klingons themselves. After all, they are difficult to miss. Klingons are often the first to announce themselves in a room. I am a Klingon. Mr. Wolf, report. Or they just punch you, which seems to be a standard Klingon greeting. They are often very good at brooding over things, which can be intimidating. They sometimes tend to be sexist. Women may not serve on the council. Except when they're not. Now we consider Klingon women our partners in battle. And they are very much racist all of the time. I do not expect you to understand. You are a Romulan. They are also very fond of William Shakespeare, which is not as surprising as it should be since both Shakespeare and the Klingons enjoy spilling copious amounts of blood. You have not experienced Shakespeare until you have read him in the original Klingon. Ah, ah. <laughs> Where did these attitudes come from? How did Klingons become so adversarial, so openly hostile? More importantly, in the history of the Klingon people, we ask, are Klingons capable of peace? Let's find out. As in many human cultures, the earliest Klingon history is shrouded in hyperbolic myth. It is said that the gods created Kortar, the first Klingon, by forging his heart from fire and steel. The gods were quite satisfied with the power and strength of this mighty heart, proclaiming it to be the mightiest heart in all the heavens. Yet the heart faltered and beat weakly. When the gods asked why, the heart of Kortar responded, I am alone. The gods immediately forged a new Klingon heart, one that beat stronger and contained more wisdom, a Klingon female. The heart of Kortar was jealous of this powerful new being, but the two Klingons realized that through their union, they would be complete. If we join together, no force, no force can, can stop. stop us. The hearts beat in unison and filled the heavens with a calamitous sound. The gods, feeling fear for the first time, tried to flee but it was useless. The two Klingons slew their creators and destroyed the heavens. Kortar, for his part, was punished for the death of the gods by being relegated to ferrying dead Klingon souls on the barge of the dead to a place called Grethor, the Klingon hell. Grethor is a place surrounded by serpent-like sirens called Koskari and guarded by Feklar, a mythological Klingon beast creature. Since Klingons are the sort of people who like being hit with pain sticks for fun, you can imagine what kind of place Grethor must be. As for who doled out the punishment for Kortar, that is not known. We learn some crucial things about Klingons from this creation tale. For one, Klingons view themselves as the most important race in the cosmos, a taste of the ethnocentrism that we see from Klingons throughout the franchise. Two, Klingons are deicidists, god killers. They live in a cultural landscape where gods once existed, but were slain, a condition that calls to the willingness Klingons have to challenge authority. And it also calls to a possible streak of secularism in Klingon society. Three, it doesn't matter what mighty deeds you accomplish in life. In the style of a Greek tragedy, you can still be subjected to a terrible fate. Life is hell, and the universe is indifferent to your concerns. You only have to be true to your honor, and to the honor of your family and comrades. Kalis left us, all of us, our powerful legacy, a way of thinking and acting that makes us Klingon. 
What is important is that we follow his teachings. Perhaps the words are more important than the man. When we turn to the modern Klingon ethos, we have to talk about Kalos the Unforgettable. In case you forgot, Kalos is like a Jaguar Knight Confucius person, a warrior of great skill who always says the right things, like that boyfriend you've always wanted. Apart from the story of Kortar, very little is known of Klingon life before Kalos. The earliest recorded history begins with his story. In a real sense, to understand him is to understand what it is to be Klingon. In the 9th century, the Klingon home planet Kronos was ruled by the warlord Molor. Molor had such power over Klingon society that it was said that there was no one who could oppose him. None except Kalos. There was apparently a feud between Molor and Kalos, which hints at the possibility that Kalos himself was some sort of warlord or leader before his rise to legendary status. Molor sent 500 warriors to the city of Kamchi. The city was all but defenseless. Kalos and the Lady Lucara were the only two who stood their ground. When they defeated Molor's warriors, Kalos and Lucara were so enthralled by the experience that they jumped on each other and made love in the Klingon style. Whatever that means. Their union became known as the greatest romance in Klingon history. They married a short time later, and moments after they completed their vows, more of Molor's troops attacked and nearly killed the newlyweds. This scene of marital violence is ritually reenacted in Klingon weddings. The final showdown between Kalos and Molor happened at the River Skrall. Kalos was victorious, and the river ran crimson with Molor's blood. Kalos defeated the tyrant in one-to-one -one combat using the first batleth, a sword of honor. This first batleth was forged by Kalos himself and became known as the Sword of Kalos. He created it by dropping a lock of his own hair into the lava of the Kristok volcano, then cooling it in the lake of Lursor. From those tempered strands, he forged his sword. The Sword of Kalos would go on to become one of the most sacred relics of the Klingon people. Molor's defeat became a holiday that is still celebrated annually throughout the empire, known as the Kat Baval Festival. The festival features a ceremonial reenactment of the epic battle between Kalos and Molor. A side note for this time period regards that of the Fekiri. Kalos defeated the Fekiri around the same time as he defeated Molor. But who were the Fekiri? Were they working with Molor? Were they Molor's army? Were they a different Klingon culture elsewhere on Kronos that threatened Kalos' new rule? Are they related to the mythical Feklar Klingon beast creature who guards Grethor? The source material is unclear. After the defeat of Molor, Kalos presided over the new Klingon Empire as its first emperor, along with the Lady Lucara. He infused a code of ethics and a warrior philosophy into the culture of Kronos that would guide the spirituality of Klingon society from that time onward. Reverence for Kalos became intense. Stories of his deeds and adventures became the doctrinal text of the Klingon people. These stories were handed down from generation to generation. Kalos' whole life became the template for every Klingon to follow. One of the last stories of Kalos regards his departure from Kronos. When Kalos saw that his work was finished, he gathered his belongings to leave. Other Klingons followed, weeping, asking him not to go. Kalos said, You are Klingon. You need no one but yourselves. He said he was leaving for Stova Kor, the Klingon afterlife for the honored dead, and that he would return one day. He pointed to a star in the sky and said, Look for me there, on that point of light. In later centuries, Klingons would visit that star, a place now called Boreth, and build a monastery to wait for Kalos' return. Boreth is considered the most sacred place in the Klingon realm. While this appears to be the end of the tales and myths surrounding Kalos, the great Klingon will indeed make a surprising appearance centuries later. I have returned. So what do Kalos' life and times tell us about the Klingon people? What information can we squeeze out of these extravagant tales? For one, Klingon society may have been feudal in nature, with the general population bound in service to lords or city-states, and those city-states may have been hostile toward each other. Also, and perhaps more interestingly, Klingons may not have always been the honor-driven culture that we currently know them to be. Kalos is credited with introducing the honor-filled warrior lifestyle, after all, which leaves us to imagine the Klingons of a pre-Kalos Kronos as something entirely different. Violent, yes, but perhaps not dominated by a warrior caste seeking honor above all. 
Additionally, if the Fekiri are to be interpreted as just another Klingon group existing at the time, then this opens the door to Kronos as a multicultural world, which stands in stark contrast to the monocultural, warrior-based Klingons we know in the 23rd and 24th centuries. Kalos's new empire continued with other emperors making their mark. The Emperor Sompak was known for his conquest and massacre of Tong Ve, a Klingon city. The Emperor Mur Ek standardized safer training among his troops. Although Klingon society was finding a post Kalos stability, cultural evolution was still underway. By the 14th century, Klingons had removed most or all vestiges of religion on Kronos, continuing a surprising streak of secularism that reaches back to Klingon foundational myths. Our gods are dead. Ancient Klingon warriors slew them a millennia ago. They were more trouble than they were worth. Also during the 14th century, Kronos was invaded by the Herk. The Herk, which is the Klingon word for outsider, were an alien race from the Gamma Quadrant of the galaxy, traveling to Kronos, possibly by way of the Bajoran wormhole. This invasion was devastating, but short-lived. It is unclear if the Herk were too nomadic to stay on Kronos, or if the Klingons put up a formidable resistance. In the end, Kronos was raided of many valuable possessions and resources, including the Sword of Kales, which was subsequently lost for a thousand years. The source material is unclear on this, but the Herc invasion might have been the first alien contact in Klingon history. If so, the sort of political and cultural postures we see Klingons take toward aliens in later centuries can, perhaps, be traced to this first encounter with the Herc. Maybe the Herc pushed Klingons to be more guarded, maybe even more cynical about alien races. Perhaps the realization that Klingons weren't alone in the universe helped push the trend toward a less religious, more secular society. Interestingly, by the late 24th century, the Herc were known to be extinct. During the 16th century, the Empire's second dynasty was brought to a violent end through a vicious coup d'etat. General Cotrellan assassinated Emperor Reclaw and put the entire royal family to death, including the Emperor's daughter Shannara. A curious new form of government was put into place, a Klingon council of elected representatives, a democracy of sorts. It lasted only 10 years and is considered by Klingon historians as the dark time. Afterwards, the third dynasty was given life and authority by assuming the names and titles of deceased imperial family members in order to create the illusion of unbroken imperial succession. In summarizing the pre-warp period of Klingon history, we've seen that Klingons are prone to hyperbole and that they view their feudalistic past through a sentimental mythological lens. Notably, Klingon society has had a strong secular tendency, which starkly contrasts with most Earth societies. The empire founded by Kalos soldiered on, changing course with the rule of subsequent emperors, adapting to coup d'etats and experiments in governance, and surviving a brutal alien invasion, perhaps the worst of all first contact scenarios. However, the defining moment for Klingons, as it was for humanity, was the advent of warp technology. Through warp travel and interactions with other interstellar states, the Klingon warrior philosophy is tested in previously unimaginable ways. Will Klingon cultures survive the wider galactic stage? Do Klingons have the capacity to make peace with aliens whose capabilities are beyond the Klingon imagination? How much of the Klingon spirit will have to change? Click on part two to find out. Greetings, it's me. The Voice. I just want to say thank you for watching, and thank you to our Patreon supporters who helped make this video possible. If you'd like to see more Trexpertise, then hit the subscribe button, and consider contributing through Patreon. Patreon really is the best way to support Trexpertise. Also, I have an extra copy of the brand new Star Trek Encyclopedia, a beautiful two-volume set written by Michael and Denise Okuda. It is the go-to source for information on all things Trek. I'm going to be giving it away to one lucky fan on December 20th. If you want this copy of the Star Trek Encyclopedia, all you have to do is subscribe to my other YouTube channel and leave one comment on any one video on the channel. The comment should be in the form of a haiku about Data's cat written from the perspective of Data. Leave your comment by December 19th and we will randomly select one of you to receive the encyclopedia. Thanks.